Hey guys, John Dutter, Matt here. Just a quick note before we get started with today's episode, I wanted to remind you guys about an opportunity that Lions of Liberty has. We've partnered up with Ocean Builders. What is Ocean Builders? Well, if you remember a few weeks ago, I interviewed the CEO, Grant Romolt, and what they are doing, they have bought a cruise ship that they are docking off the coast of Panama. They are setting up a, uh, it's a, a crypto cruise, a, a crypto cruise ship. Uh, people can buy rooms on the ship, live there, start businesses. Every single business on the ship is going to accept Bitcoin, at least at a, at a minimum. They can accept other currencies too. The plan is from there to build out and Ocean Builders has some awesome designs for sea uh, pods that uh, are actually, you'll be living, floating uh, on the ocean. And they also have land pods too. Really cool designs. Encourage you to go check it out. You can find that information by going first to lionsofliberty.com slash ocean. And you can find the podcast there to get more information. And then you can go ahead and click on through to uh, the link there and learn how to start your sea steady journey. All right, let's get rolling with today's show. Welcome to Felony Friday, a presentation of the Lions of Liberty podcast. Here is your host, John Odermatt. Felons, friends, and freedom lovers, welcome back to another edition of Felony Friday, a weekly show right here on the Lions of Liberty podcast network. And guys, got another great episode coming for you today as we get closer and closer to uh, Christmas, to the holidays, get closer and closer to the end of 2020. I just want to remind everyone out there that we do have three shows on Lions of Liberty. And if you're not subscribed, then you're not going to get all three shows delivered to your phone. In fact, you'll get none delivered to your phone and you got to go searching for the podcast. and It's annoying. So just go hit the subscribe button wherever you're listening to this, be it Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, whatever you're on, whatever podcasting app, Overcast. I like that one. Um, do that and you'll get our Monday show with Mark Clare, our Wednesday show, Electric Liberty Land with Brian McWilliams, and this show, Felony Friday. So what more could I ask for? Well, I could ask for something else and I will. I'm going to ask for you, if you've been listening for a while and you really enjoy the show, please consider giving us a five-star rating and leaving a uh, nice little review. And if you want to put a little question you want us to ask on the show uh, that, you want to, that you're curious about, uh, drop that at the end of your review, and uh, we will try to get to it in an upcoming uh, an upcoming review answer session podcast. I guess we'll call it that. But uh, that's really all I got, guys. So I've got a great interview coming up, and uh, let's get right into it. My guest today on Felony Friday is Catherine Bernard. She is a Brookhaven, Georgia attorney specializing in indigent defense and constitutional advocacy. She attended the, the law school of the law school at the University of Virginia, and she is the founder of Spartacus Legal. Now, Spartacus Legal, a very unique organization. Um, It was formed to provide assistance to individuals who are experiencing hardship as a result of their contact with the criminal justice system, and that is a lot of people who have experienced hardship. Uh, To support, uh, she through Spartacus Legal, they uh, provide support to attorneys representing these individuals, and uh, they also provide education to the larger community about the nature of these experiences. And another goal is to solicit greater public engagement uh, with the operations of the criminal justice system and to uh, interact uh, and provide broad advice, consultation, support to elected and appointed officials. Catherine, welcome to Felony Friday. Thank you so much for having me, John. I'm glad to be here. Thank you so much for coming on the show. And I have to say that you are one of the most requested guests that I've had uh, probably within the past year or so to uh, to come on the show. So I know I'll have some pleased listeners out there. Well, I hope I won't disappoint them. I'm sure you won't. Uh, before we get into you know talking about some of your specific cases and some of the uh, the tactics that you use, you know, talking about empowering juries, things like that, if we can kind of turn back the clock to you know before you decided to pursue a career in the law. So if you could tell us what what motivated you, what uh, what drew you towards a uh, career with the law. 
Well, I have to admit, I'm one of those kids who just never thought I was going to be anything but a lawyer. Uh, In fact, my parents like to tell the story about taking me to UVA uh, to visit the grounds when I was little. I'm the fourth one in my family to go there for law school. And my dad says I started crawling towards the admissions office. I don't know how true that is, but I know that as long as I knew that you had to be something when you grew up, I was going to be a lawyer. I like to argue. I like things to be fair. And I've just always had an impulse to make sure that that everyone's getting justice. And... Why, why the focus on constitutional law? Is that something that happened that you knew going in that you wanted to focus on that? Or is, what, uh, what pushed you in that direction? Well, I did debate in high school. So a lot of studying philosophy, political philosophy, uh, you know, with the people who now are all at Department of Justice and prosecutors and, and other places. And so I certainly got a lot of familiarity with constitutional law and political philosophy uh, during that stage. Uh, then I went to college, you know, knew I was going to be pre-law, but, you know, frankly, it was a it was a good time. It was turn of the century in Atlanta, and we weren't really focused on politics and constitutional law. I look at some kids who have gotten really engaged in all of that early in college, and on the one hand, I you're getting an advantage, but on the other hand, getting into it too early can really deprive you of a perspective that other people have on the world. So I was just kind of generic lawyer uh, all through law school, actually. I didn't even take criminal law, uh, criminal procedure. I thought I was going to be a corporate lawyer like everyone else. And that's what I was. You know, I summered at uh, Morrison and Forster in D.C. and Rogers and Hardin in Atlanta and then started out as a general litigation associate after I graduated from law school. You know, spent two years working, you know, up on the 25th floor of the International Tower of the Peachtree Center. And I have to tell you, civil litigation for corporations is not that interesting. You've got a lot of... Is it anything like the show Suits? Have you ever seen Suits? You know, I haven't. That's the one with Meghan Markle, right? Yeah, yeah. uh, Check that out. Uh, I feel like it's got to be more exciting than it actually was, or they wouldn't be able to have a show about it. Uh, You know, you're you're looking through countless emails. We had one case, I remember actually, uh, Taser was being sued because they were representing their products as less lethal. And in fact, people had died from taser use. And you would think, oh, that's an exciting case, right? Not so much when you're just having to read through all of these emails and kind of abstruse regulations. Uh, So actually, you know, I spent two years doing that and then just really felt called to do something else. I ended up applying to the Central Public Defender System in Georgia, moving from Atlanta down to Dublin, uh, which is, if you stick a pin right in the middle of Georgia, there's Dublin, Uh, becoming a public defender, started trying cases. And it was just that feeling, wow, I am where I am supposed to be. You know, I'm actually trying cases in the courtroom. I'm actually representing real people. Mm -hmm. You know, I had gone through all of that, you know, career, uh, you know, debate and college and law school. And I'd never really had a conception of law as something that was done to people. You know, law was just something that my friends and I talked about and had good conversations and discussions about. Becoming a public defender, it was the scales really fell from my eyes about what law really was. And that's what really got me fascinated in the constitutional implications and really just how do we design law that works for society? So so that was just uh, you said that you just had a shift and you decided to go into uh, to become a public defender. Was there something specific that, that pushed you in that direction or? Not really, other than just uh, realizing I couldn't spend the rest of my life uh, looking at documents on the 25th floor of an office building. Um, You know, I I think sometimes uh, things just happen for a reason, as they say. I ended up applying, you know, as I mentioned, I applied to the Central Public Defender System. I interviewed with another office up in North Georgia before I went down to Dublin and uh, it's funny that that office was was more of your typical public defender office, kind of small, depressing, uh, you know, great people, very smart people getting getting great stuff done. But I really, you know, I, I found my niche in Dublin. I found a, a bunch of quirky lawyers who liked to win. Uh, we had a boss who had had previously been a prosecutor and a very successful private defense attorney. He liked to win. And he understood the incentives that can keep public defenders from being successful because, you know, public defenders, let's be honest, you're working for the Mm -hmm. state. So if you're winning too much, you might find your funding getting cut. And it was great to learn from a boss who understood those incentives and could help us navigate justice in that world. 
So do you have any cases specifically that when you look back on your past as a public defender that, that jump out to you as being very significant? So many, so many. In fact, just today, um, you know, I had a, a case pop up on the calendar for a young man who I represented him at trial in 2014. Uh, there was a terror fight. Uh, he and some of his friends, uh, one of them had actually attacked a man on the street for no reason. My client not involved in the fight, but he was filming it. And at first I thought, you know, hey, why should you get in trouble for filming a fight? You know, you're not the one hurting anybody. But then when you watched the video and saw what was going on, it became clear that really the person who was filming was the one egging them on, that the rest of them might not have engaged in this highly antisocial and destructive behavior without somebody there to record it and share it with the world. So that's one that just stands out because, you know, again, uh, that young man has been accused of violating his probation and is now back in court. Uh, but another one that comes to mind is Antonio Willis back in 2017. There were some headlines today about a man who his life sentence was commuted because he was convicted of selling $20 worth of marijuana. And it reminded me of Antonio Willis back in 2017, who was uh, accused of selling marijuana to an undercover officer. When you actually got the video, you saw the undercover officer had pretended to be a day laborer. The police had actually paid to get kind of an old beat up car and fill it up with construction materials. And they were driving around trying to trick people into, you know, becoming friends with them and getting them to sell the marijuana so then they could bust them. And fortunately, we had it all on tape. Everything from the officer's horribly racist accent, you know, like something out of a Cheech and Chong movie wow. uh, that really they were, you know, they approached this man you know, he, he wanted a job. That's why he wanted to reach out. And they said, oh, hey, can you get me some pot? And so he bicycled over and got them the pot. Uh, you know, he was ready to, to take a deal on that case. But I really believe that the jury was going to see this is a good, hardworking guy not doing anything wrong. And fortunately, they agreed. It only took them 18 minutes to acquit him on all charges. Wow, that's incredible. Now, you've developed these... Uh tactics. I know you don't like the term jury nullification. Talk about empowering uh, empowering a jury. Can you take us through exactly what you mean by that and maybe give some some background on where, you know, where you got the the motivation or, or the ideas to to really use that use those tactics? Well, I still haven't found a substitute for jury nullification that really captures the concept quite as well. So even though, yes, I, I have shared that I'm concerned about kind of the negative implications that people might think, oh, this is some crazy radical doctrine rather than something inherent in the jury system itself. Mm -hmm. You know, ever since, you know, we've had ever since we've had juries, you know, the, the first case where jury nullification became an issue was 17th century England, where William Penn was arrested for preaching in the streets. And the jury said, well, yeah, I mean, we agree he was preaching in the streets. We just don't want to convict him. And so the judge actually ordered the jury locked up until they would give him the verdict. So I, I certainly got my, my interest piqued by this just by the, the mechanics of trial, talking to jurors, talking, you know, finding out what they were interested in and how much that lined up with the law. And, you know, it's no secret. I think drug war is immoral. I think it hurts people. I think it's bad public policy. Um, and I, I found myself encountering a lot of other people who felt the same way. And, you know, I studied the Georgia Constitution, which not all constitutions have this language, but we do have very specific language that says in all criminal trials, the jury shall be the judges of the law and the facts. I mean, that's just the language in the Constitution. And the judges love to try to talk around it, but you know, that's, that's what it says. The jury is the judge of the law and the facts, not the judge. And so, you know, I've, I've just tried to, to take that principle and bring it to the courtroom and really remind the jury that they are the ultimate decision makers. Just because 97% of cases get resolved by a plea bargain, frankly, I think it might be higher. Uh, mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that the jury isn't still the very highest authority in, in our system. And really, if the jury doesn't have the right to, to nullify or to vote not guilty because they don't think someone should be convicted under a particular law, then they're just, you know, the servants of the government. Without that independent conscience, they lose their role as the protector of the community. 
So is there something you were talking about when you're when you're speaking with the jury when you're when you're selecting the jury? Do you look for you know certain qualities or certain values in the uh, jury members you're selecting that you know might be more open to you know embracing that uh, being empowered and, and uh, as you as you quoted there you know being the uh, what is it the what's the constitutional quote from the from the Georgia Constitution? The judge of the the jury is the judge of the law and the facts. The judge of the law and the facts. So do you try to find people who, who align with that? I do. Uh, I do. I've, I've talked to a lot of different jurors. I really enjoy the voir dire process. It's a great way to, to get to know people in the community. And in fact, um, again, I'm, I'm feeling a little nostalgic right now because it's been so long since we've gotten to have jury trials. But there's something really special about gathering people from all walks of life together in the courtroom to talk about their experiences and to take on this important role. And it's a real privilege. You know, I mean, people are sharing secrets about their lives in that situation. But I do try to look for people who don't have some kind of financial incentive tying them to the state. You know, people who work for the state in some capacity, it's going to be harder for them to accept the idea that the state might not be all powerful. Mm. Uh, So that's one of the things that I look for. You know, I look for people who, you know, aren't making a little face when we ask about the the principle of innocent until and unless proven guilty, because, you know, that's a question I like to ask. Does anybody think that just because the defendant is sitting here in a chair charged with a crime, that that means he must have done something? Sometimes I'll get a few people who'll say yes. Some people won't say anything, but they'll kind of, you know, tighten up their lips and make a little movement. And you think, you know, that's a person who who is making a judgment just based on the fact that the person has been charged. But really, um, I've been just so pleasantly surprised to see what a diverse group of people have embraced this concept of the fully empowered jury. You know, I've had multiple juries at this point in different parts of the state come to the same conclusion on these drug cases. And, you know, it's been conservative white men, older black women, young people, middle class people. It's really a very diverse group. And I think that shows that it's a, a unifying principle for our constitutional republic. Hey, everybody, taking a quick break here from the show. Wanted to remind you all to check out. Uh, my man Tyler Colford, aka Crypto Man, and his new song "Free Ross." If you didn't hear my recent interview with Lynn Ulbricht, that was episode Felony Friday, episode two hundred thirty. Interviewed Lynn Ulbricht, played Tyler's song uh, "Free Ross." It's fantastic, phenomenal. Not just for uh, the message of freeing Ross Ulbricht, but overall for changing the broken criminal justice system. All the proceeds from uh, the Free Ross song, hashtag Free Ross by Crypto Man. You can find it on Spotify and Amazon, Amazon Music. 100% of the proceeds from the song, hashtag Free Ross by Crypto Man, go towards Free and Ross Ulbricht. So please check it out. These are perilous times when they ruin your lives over victimless crimes and they sever your ties from your business loved ones and family why New slave play, but they barely pay you. Don't care about work ethic or major. I, I believe it is. And uh, like to talk about a specific case, I know a case that comes to mind for me, and I, I remember reading about this, uh, Giovanni McCoy, that was what, 2018. Um, could you tell us a little bit about that case and... Really, you know, how did you use that uh, that tactic of empowering the jury in order to in order to win the case? Well, Giovanni, he actually his his name is Giovanni Mondre McCoy. He goes by Dre, uh, but he is just a wonderful guy. And and so I, I will say, jurors are very good at at sensing the person they are dealing with. And so I think part of it is they really just saw this was a good guy. But he ended up being charged with aggravated assault and uh, manufacturing marijuana for growing cannabis. He is part of a very large family. He has a lot of half brothers and sisters. And one of his half brothers, you know, kind of a a ne'er do well, but he was father to Giovanni's nephew and he he needed a place to stay. And and Giovanni says, oh, you know, I I really prefer not to, but I don't want to let my nephew be homeless, but, you know, don't bring any of your drama and problems over here. Well, The brother brought some drama and problems, including some cocaine that Giovanni ended up getting charged with um, and uh, attacked Giovanni. And so he had to. And again, we're talking about rural Georgia here, so I'm not trying to shock anybody. He had to shoot his brother in the shoulder with a 22. 
And then he drove him to the hospital because that's what you do when you've got to, you know, calm somebody down. And so he ended up, the police came back to the scene to investigate. And that's when they found, you know, he had been growing marijuana plants at his home. Um, And so they arrested him on aggravated assault, possession of cocaine for his brother, cocaine and manufacturing marijuana. So ultimately, you know, the case took a very long time. He, he spent um, almost a year in jail just waiting uh, to get a bond. Uh, and then it took another two or three years, I think, to actually get to, to trial on the case. Um, you know, the, the initial incident happened on July 4th, which that was one of the, the fun things we emphasized to the jury. But by the time we got to trial, the prosecution had dropped all of the charges except manufacturing marijuana. You know, shooting people, not a big deal to the state, but the drug war, they're really going to push forward on that. What, and what, I think was their, they, what was their rationale for that? What was the reason? I think they understood it was a self-defense case. You know, they looked at the brother and they looked at Dre and they, you know, they, they knew he was telling the truth that this was not just, you know, I'm going to go out and shoot someone. This was, I am trying to protect myself and my nephew against someone who has become irrational and violent. Uh, but they were just not going anywhere on that marijuana charge. And even though they were offering probation, you know, probation is a dangerous place to be. A lot of people don't realize you don't have full constitutional rights. Just an accusation is enough to get you locked up and you have no right to a jury trial. Plus, it is very expensive. Drug cases have big fines and then they have a lot of add-ons. So, you know, if your fine is $1,000, you're going to end up with, you know, three to $5,000 plus probation supervision fees. So, you know, Dre was very, you know, was with me on not taking probation. So he was, he was very much, you know, uh, with Antonio, I had to kind of talk him into it a little bit, but Dre was very much, you know, let, let's fight it. And so he told his story very honestly to the jury. And I will say this was a jury that was kind of a majority conservative white men. Uh, it was about hmm. half. Uh, of that demographic. And the other half was kind of, um, you know, more racially and gender diverse, but definitely, you know, not, not what people would stereotypically imagine when they think of a jury nullification jury. But, you know, Dre just told the truth about the entire situation and the evidence the state was producing, you know, they had a picture of his gardening cabinet with his fertilizer and his organic, you know, pesticide And they were presenting this as, you know, evidence that he was engaged in manufacturing cannabis. But I think, you know, we were really effectively able to show the jury, you know, this is not evidence that he is causing harm to anyone. And one of the ways that they write the indictments in Georgia is they will say, you know, such and such is accused of committing this crime against the good order, peace and dignity of the state of Georgia. And so that was one of the arguments I made to the jury. What was he doing that was against the good order, peace and Mm. dignity of the community? And so I think that was very resonant. Then I also did bring up the Constitution and the part about the jury being the judge of the law and the facts. And the prosecutor objected. He said, I shouldn't be able to talk about it. And then the judge sustained the objection. I will say this is one of my favorite moments. After the judge sustained the objection, I turned around to the jury and said, Ladies and gentlemen, this is why we have a constitution, because judges and prosecutors will try to tell you something different. I didn't get locked up, which was nice, uh, (laughs) but (laughs) then they acquitted. So it was uh, it was a a really it was a fascinating case. Very, you know, it took a couple of days, uh, very, you know, hard fought. There were a couple of news stories about it afterwards. They interviewed jurors. But really, it was just a, a feel good story about ultimately the right thing happening, even after the law enforcement and justice system dragged an innocent man through that entire process. Mm -hmm. So do you think that really being able to empower juries, you know, for juries to be able to to nullify for for lack of using a different term, do, do you think that this can be done outside of Georgia that, you know, widely in other states or are there that you know of uh, things that would hinder being able to do that, other obstacles that would really stop this from being sort of like a a widespread movement? Well, I'll say there's obstacles even in Georgia, because just to be fully candid, you know, Giovanni's case was in Lawrence County, which was where I started as a public defender in 2009. And the judge, you know, actually, when I had started, he was a fellow defense lawyer. So I had tried cases with him before. And, you know, so it's quite it's quite likely that in another situation with a judge that I didn't know as well, you know, he could have ordered me locked up 
for you know disregarding what he said, which would have been an interesting situation in and of itself. Uh, but certainly the relationships that I had and the credibility that I had built up in that particular circuit were a big part of why I was able to be successful with that particular argument. So even within Georgia, we've got some obstacles and certainly other states that don't have as clear of a constitutional provision to hang the hat on, you know, that's going to be a challenge because there is a lot of federal case law that basically says jury nullification exists, but you can, you, nobody can talk about it because if you talk about it, that could somehow taint the jury and their pure decision. It doesn't make sense, but that's what the Supreme Court has ruled. Uh, so there, there are a lot of obstacles, but I think at this point, it comes down to it comes down to lawyers having the courage to do it because it is it is a risk. But that's why we signed up for this job. That's why we have the honor of speaking on behalf of a person who has the full might of the state massed against them. You're going to have to take some risks if we're going to unwind a justice system that I think we all acknowledge has gotten out of hand. Absolutely. You mentioned uh, the impact of COVID before. One of the impacts being you can't have jury trials. Um, I think some states maybe are doing some, I guess they're not doing virtual jury trials, but they're doing some some virtual uh, virtual uh, trials. So what kind, of, what kind of effect do you think that'll have on the uh, justice system short term? You know, once we hopefully come out of this pandemic uh, at some point next year or at least, you know, have an easing and, and restrictions that can have, you know, I, I know you've talked about before in your social media, having jury trials with, with faces covered probably is is less than ideal. What, what kind of impact is this going to have? Are we going to have a huge backlog of, of cases that, you know, we can't work through? And what kind of impact is it having right now on, uh, do you have any clients who are, you know, just sitting in prison, just stuck there because they can't have a trial? Yes. The answer is, is yes, I do. Uh, I have spent the past nine months trying to get as many people out of jail as possible. Uh, and so right now I just have kind of a, you know, there's a group of folks who, you know, they have very serious charges that the judge is just not inclined to grant bond on under any circumstances, or they have multiple cases, like a very sweet young man who has managed to get himself four different charges involving meth. And again, the drug war is wrong. And you know, I, I I want to get him out, but it's a hard sell to a judge at that point. Mm -hmm. So I do have some folks who are stuck in jail and, and that's the really troubling part. I've actually got a trial calendar tomorrow where they're trying to have trials starting in January, but I'm speaking to folks in the community and COVID numbers are really rising. You know, the, uh, Dublin, Georgia is a big medical community. There's a veterans administration hospital as well as a, a big local hospital uh, they've got a lot of nursing homes and their their rates are very high. So I certainly don't want to bring people in to that big group setting that I just mentioned and have them be more worried about catching a virus than doing justice for my client. Uh, but mm -hmm. on the other hand, you know, sitting in jail, that's not a solution forever either. Uh, I have been to a couple of courts where they are trying to do trials with masks and plexiglass and social distancing. I'm not a fan. I have I've heard from some public defenders in other parts of the country that they have been successful, even gotten a couple of not guilties. It's too risky to me. The idea of having your defendants, your client's face covered, how is he going to interact with the jury? You know, how is he going to connect with them as a human being? Because to me, that is a huge part of the state's advantage uh, and why they are able to, you know, beat people down and get them to accept pleas and are able to get guilty verdicts even in sympathetic cases. It's because they just have so much power surrounding them. And it's so easy to, you know, well, do you want to be on the official side or on that criminal side over there? Mm -hmm. And so the mask is just another dehumanizing element that takes away that ability to recognize the defendant as, hey, this is this is a member of our community. So it's, it's hard. I've The line I have drawn at this point is I will wear a mask if it is required to conduct business in the courthouse, mm -hmm. but I am not going to wear a mask in the courtroom to advocate for my clients. And if the judge thinks that's not safe, then I guess we can't have a trial until we can't have masks. But I'm, I'm very much worried that they are trying to make this some sort of permanent situation. You know, these plexiglass palaces that they're building in courtrooms right now, they don't look temporary to me. So if we could turn, I guess, for, for a minute here and 
I want to ask you about a little bit of libertarian activism, the Libertarian Party. I know you're you're interested in in politics and and things of that nature, and and using politics as a, a vehicle for justice reform. Uh, what do you think the Libertarian Party, or maybe any political party, Republican Party also, Democrat Party, what, what do you think that we can do on the local level, um, or should be done on the local level to start to really initiate some criminal justice reform and Federally, I mean, if there's lots of things that need to be done to reform the system, but if you had to pick a couple of things that could be done federally to really make this a a more just criminal justice system, what direction would you go in? I think the local focus is what's most important because that's where you really have the best shot at changing hearts and minds. You know, the national pageant, that's what I call it because it, you know, I was a delegate to the Republican National Convention in 2012. Uh, as a, I voted for Ron Paul, which, as you can imagine, made me very popular with the Georgia Republican Party establishment. Um, but I have just, you know, the it is a pageant. It is people playing mm-hmm. specific roles. There is, you know, it's like Sports Center. People pick a side and they get happy when their side is winning and they get sad when they're losing. And there's not really that sense of like, I want to think about this and potentially change my mind. But at the local and state level, there's still some of that going on. So one of the things people can do in their local community is get involved with a community police academy. Uh, They'll call them a citizens or civilian police academy, but I always point out police are both citizens and civilians. So this idea they should get to separate themselves is not a safe one, but definitely get involved in those local programs Mm -hmm. because we are the bosses of law enforcement. You know, they are supposed to be listening Mm -hmm. to us and carrying out what we want them to do. So this idea that they have all gotten caught up in in these ridiculous, you know, public safety reducing efforts like the drug war, you know, it just doesn't make sense. And so at the local level, when it's, you know, time for budgeting and funding, that's when you can have a voice as a taxpayer saying, hey, you know, do we really need to be so reliant on seizing money from drivers uh, or, you know, traffic tickets? So I would definitely advocate getting involved at the local level, Um, you know, your DA's office, you know, DA is an elected position in most places. uh, So the DA races can have a big difference. Um, And then at the state level, that's where the laws come into play that most people are sitting in prison under, you know, federal federal prisons, obviously lots of people sitting in federal prisons. But state law is where most drug cases are prosecuted. And so that's where, you know, no knock warrants, you know, those are all state law issues. And actually just a little bit of a plug, I'm very excited. Uh, this We have a Senate committee on law enforcement reform here in Georgia active right now. And they have just invited me to come speak on no knock search warrants next Tuesday. Okay. So I'm very excited to uh, tell them all about why no knock search warrants are the worst ever. I would also, um, people should check out the Forced Trajectory Project. Um, It's a group, um, they're active all over the country, but particularly in Nevada right now. And they just put out an incredible teach-in with the National Association for Criminal Justice, where they went through some of the specific laws that are coming up in the Nevada legislature and, you know, how they are lobbying for or against them and also bringing in impacted families of people who have been, you know, hurt by police. And so I would encourage people to check that out. It just came out last week, the Forced Trajectory Project. Um, and their teaching on the subject. And we're trying to get some of those going around the country because that kind of state law engagement is where we have an opportunity to make a difference. Um, And, you know, you can do that through the Libertarian Party, through the Republican Party, through the Democratic Party. Uh, Really, you've just got to be there. The parties uh, are not quite as important as they want you to think they are. I I agree with that. It is a it's a uh, reality show, really, that, that we're watching. And well, you're you're in the middle of of, of a, a side show right now with uh, what's happening in Georgia with the uh, the double Senate runoff. But what's your what's your takeaway on that whole situation? With uh, you have the double Senate runoff, and um, you know, obviously, what happened with the the controversy around the vote counting and you know, suitcases of uh, votes under tables and, and different things like that. Do you get involved in any of that or uh, do you have do. A, a, a do opinions on it? <laughs> and, you know, I, I think probably I would be better at politics if I could just, you know, focus on one issue instead of going after everything. 
But I really think it's important that we don't silo issues of government accountability Mm -hmm. because I think, you know, I I meet so many great activists, you know, working on imminent domain issues, you know, property being seized, you know, especially in in inner cities. Um, And then I meet people who are concerned about, you know, police brutality and killing and then people who are concerned about, you know, taxes and public safety. Mm -hmm. And, And you're all concerned about the same thing, which is how we can build the best life for our community. And frankly, you know, one of the biggest obstacles, if not the biggest obstacle, is government doing things wrong. Um, And it it has really just caused tremendous problems for us. So, yes, I have gotten engaged in the election fraud issues, and uh, I've gotten a lot of hard times from my uh, criminal justice friends. I'm pretty much the only criminal defense lawyer I know who did not vote for Joe Biden, uh, which is kind of crazy to me, you know, crime bill Joe and his cop VP. And yet somehow everyone, you know, is voting for him after a summer of BLM. But hey, politicians are politicians. Mm. And I say we work with whoever is in office to get justice. But I do think that there were some serious irregularities in our election and not for the first time. There's been a lawsuit against the Dominion voting machines since 2017 in Georgia. And even as recently as October 2020, Judge Amy Totenberg, actually, I believe she's the sister of Nina Totenberg from NPR, issued an order against Dominion. She did not order uh, paper ballots to be used as requested, but her opinion noted the very serious security flaws in the Dominion system that the plaintiffs had successfully brought up. And this was a nonpartisan group of plaintiffs. You know, it included hardcore Tea Party conservatives and hardcore progressive Democrats, all opposing the Dominion system because it does have. I actually I figured out, you know, from these uh, filings what the issue is. Dominion allows the customer to set a threshold for what is considered a problem ballot. And so you can set that threshold very high. So if somebody, you know, fills in 99% of their bubble, oh, that's a problem ballot. And then it gets sent off into this other part of the system that has no tracking log and is just directly in Windows. So you can basically move ballots around like, you know, into the recycle bin of, of a Windows machine and there's no accountability log for it. So, it, oh, you know, the idea. That- so, so if they set a very high threshold, that would kick more ballots into this whatever, just a limbo where they could go anywhere. Right. So- and that's that was the issue. You know, when you hear about the, the ballots, you know, under the table, um, which we still we're still not 100 percent sure where those ballots came from. They they may be real ballots that were placed there legitimately. But, you know, the fact that observers were dismissed, that the media was dismissed, everyone was told counting is done for the night, go home. Oh, but then surprise, we're going to keep counting and scanning. And we've gotten about five different stories about how that happened. And the Secretary of State just uh, is not really interested in being transparent mm-hmm. about that, which I, I found out, unfortunately, the, the reason why, you know, Fulton County, which is the, the big county that makes up city of Atlanta, uh, the Secretary of State official who you've probably seen on the news, Gabe Sterling, he is from Fulton County uh, and was a city councilor there and ran for county commission and has given handsome contracts to a number of Republican officials like County Commissioner Liz Hausman, who's making $6,000 a month from the Secretary of State's office for uh, working on the election. There's a lot of just, you know, let's not dig too deep and find out, you know, who's getting money and whose responsibility this is. So to me, it's not a partisan issue. You know, I voted for Joe Mm -hmm. Jorgensen. Um, So it's not like I'm trying to get Trump elected. I'm just saying there's room to think that cheating happened and dismissing people who say that it did is is not a safe thing for our republic. Yeah, it's almost... It's almost like the system is designed to allow cheating. I mean, even up to the point that there's not enough time to actually, you know, take anything to court to to present any evidence. Everything moves so quickly. But the thing that sticks out to me, and uh, I'm in Pennsylvania, so another controversial state, but I know it's in Pennsylvania when there's mail-in ballots. And really, mail-in ballots are pretty new to Pennsylvania. We've had our absentee ballots, but this, you know, this number has really never been done before. And my understanding is they separate the envelope from the actual ballot and they're never linked again. So other ballots could make their way in, could be, you know, slipped into the process after that. And there's no, uh, you know, direct link that you can go back and actually verify that ballot to the envelope after it's opened and separated, which is just complete insanity to me. I don't know if it's the same in Georgia. 
It is. And, you know, it's tough because obviously we do value the secret ballot. And so you don't want to be able to necessarily permanently tie the content of someone's ballot to their name and identifying information. But a very basic check that we have been asking for in Georgia is, well, can we at least match up the number of envelopes with the number of absentee ballots? You know, even if we can't match up the specific ones, Mm -hmm. that way we know that all of these absentee ballots actually arrived you know, in an envelope instead of, you know, hot off the presses from the Dominion printing uh, location that one of our witnesses testified to the legislature about. Um, So yes, it's a lot of opportunities for fraud, which is not the same thing as fraud, we should emphasize. But I just get very uncomfortable when people say, oh, trust the government, everything's fine, especially when we all remember 2018 and 2016. And, uh, the narrative was not uh, election integrity at that point. That's for sure. No, oh, yeah, it's it's funny how everything flips around so quickly. But uh, I, I know you have a commitment after this, so I don't want to take any more of your time. Um, if you could just uh, share with my audience where they can learn more about Spartacus Legal or, or learn more about uh, anything else you're you're working on, and, and would like to plug. Well, I, I'm on Facebook a lot. That is my big social media. I'm trying to branch out a little bit more, uh, but you can find me, Catherine Bernard. I've got a public page as well as a personal profile. It's Catherine with a C. You can find my Spartacus legal page where I do share lots of stories about police accountability. Um, and, you know, just sometimes it's, it's good to empower people with, hey, we, we can stick up for ourselves against the police. That, that's That's the important thing. Uh, And then you can also check out my law firm page, which is justice.law, www.justice.law. My partner is a civil rights lawyer. And so we, you know, we, when the Rainbow family came to Georgia two years ago and got harassed uh, by law enforcement all over the state, you know, he, he came up and we, we defended some of their criminal cases and now have filed a few civil suits on their behalf. So we're trying to figure out, you know, what's the best way to to actually manage to fight the state because they just have so many advantages. All right. Well, Catherine, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me, John. Hope you guys enjoyed that episode of Felony Friday. Another awesome episode. Just want to remind everyone before you get going here off to your next, uh, next podcast and your shuffle or whatever it is you're doing with your, uh, your day today. I want to thank you for giving me your time and uh, listening to this interview. I want to ask you, please, to share this with a friend. The only way that we're going to expand this message that we're going to reform this criminal justice system is by sharing interviews just like this with your network. Very easy to do. And I also want to ask you to please, if you have not yet checked it out, you need to go to the Lions of Liberty store. It's lionsofliberty.store. We have a bunch of new t-shirt designs, really interesting stuff, really eye-catching designs. Uh, Of course, our taxation is death shirt has been a hit. It's selling like crazy. We now have the uh, the tax on wax off shirt, just awesome. And and there's more coming. We're really trying to get into uh, what we're calling it the Lions of Liberty brand of shirts. So you're going to get the cool design on the front and then up just real small up by the tag on the back. You're going to have our Are You Ready to Roar logo. Uh, We're trying to, you know, take another angle here and influence people through, uh, you know, some snazzy t-shirts. So check it out, lionsofliberty.store. And remember, if you're in the Lions of Liberty pride, you get 20% off. So for as little as five bucks a month, you're going to get 20% off all your t-shirt orders. So to join the pride, go to patreon.com slash Lions of Liberty and... With that being said, guys, thank you so much for joining me. Have a great weekend or week or whenever you're listening to this. Just have an awesome day. I'll talk to you next week. This is John Odermatt signing off. Always remember to keep your head up and the fire is a liberty burning.